We'll be back with our usual Wednesday 1 p.m. time slot. And I want to thank you for tuning in today on a Thursday. But next week, we'll be back at 1 o'clock on Wednesday. As always, if you haven't yet, please sign up for the daily newsletter at governor.ri.gov. And if you haven't yet downloaded the Crush COVID app, about 100,000 Rhode Islanders have. If you haven't, now's the time to do it. And I appreciate that. So today, uh, before I go into the data, which we will do in just a second, I want to introduce the folks that I have up here with me on the stage, some new faces uh, with me this afternoon. I'm sure you've seen in the news over the past few days about what's happening in our hospitals. And the truth of it is our hospitals are overwhelmed. The staff in the hospitals are exhausted. Emergency rooms are overflowing. And staff shortages are becoming a real issue. And I've been up here week after week after week imploring you, asking the good people of Rhode Island to stay at home and change your behaviors, our behaviors, so that the folks in the hospitals who are on the front line um, don't get too overwhelmed. But I thought that instead of just hearing from me, we would have an opportunity for you to hear directly from some of the folks on the front lines. And so permit me to introduce to you who I have with me today. On the, my very far left is Dr. Sooner. Dr. Sooner works at the Emergency Room at Rhode Island Hospital, where he serves as the Director of Disaster Medicine and Emergency Preparedness. Thank you for being here. Next to him is Dr. Otis Warren, an emergency physician at the Miriam Hospital, who also serves as the President of the Rhode Island Chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. And to my right is Dr. Laura Foreman, the Chief of Emergency Medicine at Kent Hospital in Warwick. And Dr. Foreman will also be serving as the medical director of the Cranston Field Hospital when we open the Cranston Field Hospital site. And in a few minutes, when I'm done with my announcements, I'm going to invite Dr. Foreman to speak about the reality facing her and her colleagues in emergency rooms and in hospitals today. I felt that it was important to do this because um, this is very real. We are in a terrible spot. And for those folks out there who think it's okay to not follow the rules, who thought it was okay to have Halloween parties, you need to know that that's costing lives. And uh, I was chatting with these physicians earlier and they were just saying, folks are tired. They, you know, they're, they're moms and dads as well, they have been working without a day off for eight months and they and their teams are tired, overwhelmed, exhausted, and it's on the rest of us to do the right thing so that our hospital systems don't get too overwhelmed. Um, so in a few minutes, I will introduce Dr. Foreman uh, to share her human experience of what it's like right now inside a Rhode Island hospital and emergency room. But before we do that, we'll do what we always do. We'll begin with the data, and I ask you to please put it up on the screen. Uh, if you take a look at the dashboard, uh, you should look at that dashboard and you should be alarmed. So I'm gonna pause for a second and ask everybody to just pause and look at the numbers. Yesterday, we had 936 new cases out of about 20,000 tests for percent positive of 4.7%. A few weeks ago, I was up here, we were under 2%. It shows you how quickly our fate can change. This is our second consecutive day with over 900 cases, so we've set a new record for Rhode Island. We also saw, very sadly, seven new deaths. You'll also see the weekly trend data on your screen, and that is the alarming part of the data, the trend, week over week. You'll see all three arrows are pointing up and a percent positive of 3.9%, new hospitalizations at 228, and new cases at 362 per 100,000. 
Uh, we've passed our thresholds for hospitalization and cases, which is why those two arrows are in red. And uh, we continue to set new daily case records. Our hospitalizations are at their highest they've been since May, and they've doubled just over the past couple of weeks. So at this rate, we will need the Cranston Field Hospital in a couple of weeks. I will point out this is not unique to Rhode Island. Uh, America, and indeed the world, is, is facing the same reality, which is uh, the second, or in some places, third wave of the virus. Yesterday, the United States set single-day records for new cases at 140,000, and also a new record for daily hospitalizations at 65,000. Nationally, we added a million new cases in just the first 10 days of the month, which is the fastest we've ever had. Massachusetts announced two days ago they're building new field hospitals. New York followed our lead and yesterday announced they'll be lowering the gathering limit to 10, which we did a couple of weeks ago, and closing businesses at 10. In Texas, they're bringing in mobile morgues. In North Dakota, their hospitals are at full capacity. Germany, the United Kingdom, and par parts of Italy are on total lockdown. That's where we're headed, folks, total lockdown, if we don't start to get more serious and follow the rules. I'm often asked, what about schools? I would like to point out that um, places are seeing a second wave or a third wave, regardless of whether the kids are in school or not. Cases are rising at the same rates everywhere, whether schools opened six weeks ago, six months ago, or haven't opened at all. And in Europe, they're generally keeping schools open even during the lockdowns. Because we all now know that schools are not major spreaders and also children suffer mightily and in the long run if we close our schools. So if it's not schools, and if we're doing a lot of testing, what is it? You know, what is it you're asking? It's what we've been talking about for weeks. Small gatherings with friends and family, people you know, people you like, people you let your guard down with, people who feel safe, that occur primarily indoors with masks off. That's, it's that simple. Earlier I was chatting with the physicians. Part of the reason they're crushed now is because people insisted on having Halloween parties a couple of weeks ago. And now you see it in the cases, clear as day. Uh, you, you continue to see it. People willfully disregarding what we're asking, which is to shut down these informal social gatherings indoors without masks. It, the hardest thing about managing this crisis is that if everybody just stopped it, just if everybody committed themselves to not having these social gatherings, to wearing masks, to limiting your social contact to a very few number of people, we would have the control to put a lid on this virus. Um, but it doesn't seem to be working that way, and I fear that we are moving towards another lockdown. Over the last few weeks, I've put in place a number of new interventions. We've been taking action week after week. A month ago, I closed break rooms and told businesses to go back to remote work. That has happened. Two weeks ago, I lowered the social gathering limit to 10. Last week, I took more aggressive steps with early business closures, a nighttime stay-at-home advisory, uh, a stop on business travel, lower capacity limits for houses of worship and venues of assembly, lower limits for catered events, lower limits for big box stores. And we're closely monitoring this to see if that's enough. 
uh, it is still my hope that that will be enough. Um, but I'm not optimistic based on what we're seeing in the data. So I'm here, I guess, one last time pleading with the people of Rhode Island to make changes in your life, to wear your mask always, to stop having social gatherings of any kind, period, and to really rein it in. That choice is yours. As I said, all over America, all over the world, we're back to lockdowns. I, I have avoided it as long as possible. I don't want to go there. I've taken a half a dozen incremental steps over the past month to apparently not much effect. I'm frequently asked, Governor, will we go back to phase two? I don't think phase two would help. It's not enough. Phase two was smaller limits at restaurants, um, you know, lower limits at retail. That's not where our problem is. Our problem is informal gatherings. Six or seven people coming over watching football, just all of us just not taking it seriously enough, hugging people. It's with people we know, violating our quarantine, sneaking out of isolation before we're supposed to. I wish the consequences weren't so dire, but the fact of it is they are. And so I worry that we're getting close to some pretty extreme measures. Uh, as for hospital capacity, Dr. Foreman's, as I said, gonna speak in a few minutes about the situation on the ground in our hospitals, but I'd like to take a second to give you the big picture of where we are, where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. We currently have 84% of our existing COVID capacity beds filled, so 16% of our COVID beds are available. At the rate we're currently seeing cases increase, uh, those beds will all be filled in about a week. Beyond that, each hospital has a plan to turn on their surge capacity so they can flex at the hospital. That would increase the number of beds available for COVID patients to about 600. Uh, that puts an enormous strain on our hospitals and on our staff. It also is a, it's a, it's a risk for the people of Rhode Island. Don't be surprised if you go to the emergency room and you're diverted to another emergency room or you're made to wait. Providence hospitals are doing this. Longer waits in the ER, longer waits to be admitted, ambulances, as I said, being diverted to another hospital in another part of the state. Uh, even with the hospital surge and the extra, you know, up to the 600 beds, we believe our hospitals will be completely filled within about three weeks, at which point we would flip over to start using the Cranston Field Hospital. I've instructed the Department of Health to begin running the drills at the Cranston Field Hospital to get ready so that, that, so that we, we, we are ready to roll when we need to turn it on. Um, the Field Hospital was, is not a full service hospital. It was built specifically for COVID patients. In the Cranston Field Hospital, there's oxygen connected to every bed, but it is not a full hospital. In the coming days, the Department of Health are gonna be working with our hospitals and nursing homes to stand up a healthcare coordination center, which will help transfer COVID patients between hospitals where there are open beds and transfer COVID patients to designated skilled nursing facilities uh, and nursing homes so we can, we need to keep the patient flow moving. You know, there are, we're at a point now where we need every available bed. So if there's somebody in a hospital and is able to be discharged to, to skilled nursing facility, we need the skilled nursing facilities to go ahead and accept those patients. I know you're nervous to do it. It's different now than it was in the spring. We have special facilities that have COVID patients. And before we release somebody to you, they will be tested at least twice to be negative before you receive them. We need you to go ahead and accept these patients so we can make space in the hospitals. 
So that's a particular ask that I have for nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities. The healthcare coordination center is going to function like an emergency operations center for hospitals. Tracking data in real time and taking a unified approach to patients statewide. We're a small enough state, we want to operate as a, as a holistic system. By the way, I want to thank the leaders at Lifespan and Care New England working seamlessly together. Uh, you see that demonstrated on this stage. This is a whole of Rhode Island response. So I'm calling on all healthcare providers to work together um, and those in the community, if you're asked to take these patients, please help us because we need to make way in the hospitals. Sometimes I wonder, I hear from people who say they're just not going to follow the rules. It doesn't really matter anyway. And it's hard for me to understand that because it does matter. Because people are dying every day. And I think if we all spent a day in the shoes of one of these patients in a hospital or a family member who's trying to get their child into an emergency room and is made to wait, I think we'd all get a little more serious about following the rules. Uh, the surge is coming at a rough time. We, I was just chatting with the physicians earlier. Not only are staffs tired because they've been working for months, um, but the hospitals are filled with patients for non-COVID issues. Back in April, uh, the hospitals were empty because folks weren't showing up with other issues. And of course, that was not a, that there was a, there's now a pent up demand for people who'd stayed out of the hospital. So now it's actually quite a bit worse than it was in April and in May because you have full capacity for you know, non-COVID healthcare issues and also a surge in COVID and also we, we have exhaustion among the teams in the hospitals, a strain on staffing levels, and it's gonna get harder and harder. And if we, when we open the field hospital, uh, that's another massive strain. So as I had to do in the spring, I am again calling on all healthcare professionals in the state of Rhode Island to please give us a hand. We will soon be needing you in the existing hospitals or in our field hospital. You can go to skillsforri.com and sign up. And those of you who received a temporary transfer license earlier in the state's response, we're gonna be extending those licenses for another six months. So if you are a retired doctor or nurse, if you are a doctor or nurse or a CNA or healthcare professional who has some time, who has an, who, who maybe you're not fully retired, partially retired, part-time employed, we need you now. We need you now, we need to staff up, and we need, we need help. So skillsforri.com, please go ahead and sign up. Okay, a little bit of good news in the state's response. Um, uh, we are constantly trying to improve our systems, and I know we do need to do better, and we are getting better every day with testing and contact tracing. The volumes are pretty intense. But one area where we've made substantial progress is making it easier for people to access their test results. Um, that's really key. If you get tested, we, and particularly if you're positive, we want you to know as quickly as possible, and then we need you to go ahead and isolate. And that's why we're, we are continuing to make testing more accessible testing in local health clinics, testing right into the community, testing in public buildings, testing um, in doctor's offices. The thing that we've lacked until now is there's not really been a clear process and a one-stop shop for people to receive the results of their test. And uh, I know that's an issue. I know that's an issue. You, you go someplace, and there's different ways to get tests. You could do the K-12 portal, you could go to your physician, you could go to a pharmacy, and there hasn't been like a, 
simple way for everybody to quickly receive their result. So today I'm announcing that as of today, that's changing. And regardless of how you've scheduled your test, everybody can access their test result by going to portal.ri.gov backslash results. Portal.ri.gov is what we've been using, backslash results. Um, so again, it doesn't matter how you schedule a test. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. If, if you get yourself a test, you don't wait for someone to call you. Don't worry. You can go yourself to portal.ri.gov backslash results. You can log in. There's a security process to authenticate that you are who you say you are. And you'll be able to access your result. This is really important. It's vital that when you go get your test, you give them a phone number or an email. Because it's that phone number or email that we will use to authenticate that you are who you say you are when you try to log in. Um, if it doesn't work, and I'm sure there'll be glitches, and I'm sorry, and we'll work to fix them, or if you don't get your result after a few days, uh, it could, there could be any number of reasons, so then you should call the same way, 222-8022, and get your result. As soon as you see that you're positive, you need to isolate yourself. Don't wait to, to be told that by the Department of Health. The minute you know you have a positive test result, go home, stay home, isolate yourself. If you don't have a secure home, if, you're, if you have a big household and it's impossible, then let us know. Call, you can call 211, that's the easiest place. And we'll figure out a way to get you the food delivery you need, get you a safe place to isolate, a hotel room if you need it. Um, but the important thing is, is that you get isolated as fast as possible. So I, this is a big deal. I want to say thank you to my team. They've worked really hard on this, the tech team. Um, a, the one-stop shop for results is going to help us a lot. Some other good news. Um, we have had great success with the Take It Outside campaign. The, as hard as the, the health crisis is, the economic crisis is just as bad and particularly hard hit have been our restaurants. Uh, we've provided 111 grants uh, and the results have been amazing, actually, providing money to help businesses take their business outdoors. We want you to keep staying outdoors as long as possible. It is so much safer outside and in places with a lot of airflow with the windows open. So continue to keep your business outdoors. We still have the Take It Outside program. The other good news is we've been in touch with cities and towns. Many of them had um, relaxed their zoning requirements to allow for outdoor dining, outdoor vending, outdoor sales. They've all agreed to maintain those relaxed zoning and permitting regulations through the end of the year. And it is my hope um, that the cities and towns will do that into next year. And I, it's my hope that, uh, you know, next year, next summer, you can do even more business than you did last summer to try to make up for some of how hard this year has been. So uh, some good news and thank you to the cities and towns. Uh, the good news is thankfully we have unseasonably warm weather. I hope that lasts. If it doesn't, we're gonna grab our coats and hats and blankets and stay outside. Um, but cities and towns are allowing the zoning restrictions to be relaxed through the end of the year. And I hope they're all gonna continue to do it into next year. Uh, more good news, the vaccine. You know, one of this, this is a terrible situation and our lives have been upended, but it's not forever. You know, I've been saying that a vaccine will come and 
hope is around the corner. And this week we had a huge boost with the news of Pfizer's vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine trial showed 90% effectiveness um, in their trials of that vaccine. And that rate of effectiveness is much higher than anybody expected. A lot of experts were, would have been thrilled with 60 or 70%. Over 90% is extraordinary. And by the way, as compared to the flu vaccine, which I got yesterday and I hope everyone gets, um, it's much more effective. Pfizer and another company called Moderna, which has taken a similar approach to their vaccine, are going to submit the data this month to the FDA. Based on that timeline and assuming things go well, we could have a vaccine in Rhode Island for a limited group of high-risk people before the end of the year, with a vaccine becoming widely available in the beginning of 2021. Uh, that's such welcome news. I hope you all breathe a sigh of relief. Hope is on the way. Um, we want this to happen quickly, but we also want it to happen safely. I'm frequently asked these days, hey, Gov, would you get the vaccine? Would you have your family get the vaccine? Um, and the answer is yes, once it goes through all of the proper channels approved by the FDA, data validated by the scientists. So I want to remind you that a few weeks ago I announced the formation of Rhode Island's very own COVID-19 vaccine subcommittee. It's a group of experts charged with conducting an independent review of the scientific data related to the COVID-19 vaccine. All the data is public. That's really important. Really important. All the data on the vaccines is public. So it's free to anyone to analyze. Uh, most of us aren't experts to analyze it, which is why I put together a Rhode Island based group of scientists who will go through all the data and give us their opinion. Um, that our local group is a layer on top of all of the safety reviews that are going to be done at the national level. So when people ask me if I would get the vaccine and I say yes, it's because I have confidence in the transparency of the process, in the process, of, and of the experts. And I like it that we have our own team of Rhode Islanders, Rhode Island experts, our friends, family, and neighbors looking out for us who are looking at the data. I've also charged the vaccine subcommittee to advise me on how to distribute the vaccine. Um, this is going to be hard. If we thought distributing N95s was hard, this is much, much harder. So I want you to know we're not sitting around waiting for the vaccine. Right now, today, I have meetings. We meet every day. We are planning for the vaccine distribution so that we're ready to hit the ground running the second we receive these vaccines. Our initial plan is already publicly available at the Department of Health's website. It calls for rolling out the vaccine to priority populations in phases based on people's level of risk. Phase one is likely to include groups that are high risk, healthcare workers, people with two or more underlying health conditions, uh, people in nursing homes, people who are very severely compromised immune systems. Phase two is likely to include teachers and school staff, childcare providers, and workers in other high-risk settings, all older adults and others. So we want to uh, be a limited supply initially, be coming to us in waves. So it's really important that we have priority and we're going to be prioritizing based upon risk. So, you know, if you're a young or young-ish healthy person, it's going to be a while before you get a vaccine. Phase three, and you'd be phase three, young adults, children, remaining lower risk individuals. Um, and we'll be, I'll be fully transparent later. I'll, I'll have a whole presentation on how we're distributing the vaccine, but I think it's important for you to know we are making a plan now. Um, each vaccine has its own requirements. Some have to be stored in particular very cold uh, freezer or refrigeration. 
Others spoil very quickly. Some are one dose, some are two dose. There's a number of manufacturers. So we are creating a plan and I have complete confidence that when the vaccines are ready, Rhode Island will be ahead of the game. Um, that's the good news. That's the light at the end of the tunnel. These next few months are the, gonna be the toughest of the virus. I've, I've come to that conclusion. We thought March and April were bad and they certainly were. And in some ways we're in better shape now. The field hospital's already ready. We already have testing. We're doing 20,000 tests a day. We're seeing outbreaks, seeing outbreaks again in nursing homes, outbreaks in other settings. We're ready. We know how to handle it. But in other ways, this is going to be much, much worse. Um, people are tired. People aren't following the rules. Uh, we're all about to go indoors now, flu season. So try to do whatever you need to do in your life with your family and your friends to ask yourself, what do you need to do to get through these next few months safely? Between now and we, when we have vaccine, how are you gonna change your life to make sure you and your family wear masks, to really make sure you're not gonna have informal gatherings and to um, take this more seriously so that we get through the next few months with as little pain, suffering, and loss of loved ones as possible. To that end, I want to make a quick note to end on about Thanksgiving. Next week, I'm going to be laying out exactly what the Thanksgiving rules will be, and they're likely to be very strict, and they will be very strict. Uh, for now, since people are planning, I'm asking you to stay home, not to travel, and to celebrate Thanksgiving with the people you live with. Um, so, and that's hard. That, for, that goes for me too. We always go, big family, to my sisters, not this year. All of us are staying at home with our kids. So I'm at, that's what I'm asking you to do. Come up with, start now planning for new traditions so that you can stay home and stay local. Because, as I just said, we're struggling now due to what happened over Halloween, and I can't let that happen with Thanksgiving, which is a much bigger holiday. Uh, also, if we want to have any hope for a nice, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, year-end celebrations, we really have to buckle down now. So many of you have been asking me, members of the press, what's, what are the exact rules for Thanksgiving? Next week, I'll issue um, official rules, but for now, the plan should just be stay home literally in your house with your family and keep it low key this year.